Since mid-January in our message times, uh, we've been sharing with you the results of last year's appreciative inquiry process. Uh, This process I also called the vision quest, uh, and our desire was to hear from Jesus and to hear from one another what he had for our congregation for this next season of ministry. Uh, During the appreciative inquiry process, which uh, took from February last year to November, uh, we spent time in community, in prayer and fasting. Uh, We listened to Jesus. We listened to one another. Uh, We drafted statements. We revised statements. We had a dessert night where we bounced our ideas off of you. Uh, We spent time uh, in conversation with our district leadership. Uh, And the end result is that we feel like we have a compass point from Jesus. We feel like we have the direction and the desires that, he's, that he has for our congregation. Uh, if you have not yet picked up one of these brochures, uh, it's available at the table in the foyer, or if you are an online person, uh, you can check it out by going to centerpointchurch.ca. It's on our homepage uh, in a special PDF. Uh, and so friends, we have our appreciative inquiry compass direction. As I shared on January 15th, our vision work begins by understanding that God is a God of mission. God moves first. He moves into relationship with people through creation. And then when humanity rebelled against him, God moved first towards us, bringing redemption and making promises and plans to restore us back to himself. Jesus' earthly ministry, death, and resurrection life demonstrate the fullness of the heart of the Father towards us for restoration. And as we consider the call that he has for our specific congregation, we first came to the place where we acknowledged that Jesus is on mission to redeem and restore all people to the Father's kingdom and return all things to his original shalom. We can't even start to think about what he has for our congregation before we first consider what Jesus is doing in the world. And the cool thing is, as Jesus is moving in the world, he's actually calling us to join him on mission. We shared on January 22nd that God calls all people and all church communities to join him on mission to invite others to follow Jesus as disciples. We're all called to make disciples as we are going. We're to tell others about Jesus. Uh, we're to teach them to obey. Uh, and, but the thing is, we all join this mission in different ways. As we considered how Jesus was calling us to join his mission, we felt that he was calling us to partner and participate in his redemptive work, by connecting the generations in Christ-centered community to make and equip spirit-empowered, multiplying disciples. That's what our mission is. That's what we are trying to do as a community. We want to connect the generations in Christ-centered community to make and equip spirit-empowered, multiplying disciples. You can listen to that message from the 22nd to dive into all that means. But in a nutshell, what we want to do is as we are calling people to follow Jesus... We are inviting them to grow and be equipped as followers of Jesus in the context of intergenerational Christ-centered community. (laughs) We believe that we grow best as we connect with people of all ages and as we learn to abide in relationship with Jesus. I need your experience. You need my experience. We all need the insight and the ideas even of the young people around us. It's amazing. Uh, The more we're doing these kids moments, the more those kids are just tucking those little nuggets in their heart. Uh, And they know that apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. And so if they know that, we start to get that in our heads. And then one day when we find ourselves trying harder or we're getting down on ourselves, we realize, hey, it's all about connecting. And so we need one another. We believe that we grow best when we're connecting with people of all ages in that context of Christ-centered community where we're learning to abide and connect with him. So as we call people to follow Jesus, as we connect the generations in Christ-centered community, as we're equipping one another to do the good works Jesus has called us to do, as we follow him, our vision and expectation is that we would see people find hope and healing in Jesus. 
The idea of a vision statement is really, if you do the mission, if you continue to do the mission part of it, what will you see in five years? What will you see in 10 years? What will you see in 20 years? And we believe that as we connect in uh, in connect the generations in Christ-centered community to make and equip spirit-empowered multiplying disciples. We believe that as we do that, we will see people find hope and healing in Jesus. On January 29th, we unpacked what we meant by hope and healing in Jesus. I'd encourage you to go back uh, and you know watch that message just because I don't have time to sort of re-preach it, but we really were kind of defining a little bit what we meant by hope and healing. And so I'd encourage you to watch that. Each week I post the sermon on YouTube. Uh, So if you're not into the whole experience, you can watch uh, just the message portion. Today, we are continuing to unpack our vision document. Uh, We've talked about God's mission. We've talked about our mission. We've talked about our vision. Uh, We come now to the idea of values. Values describe those things that are important to us, and they speak to how we will go about joining Jesus on mission. It's all about how we will invite people to experience hope and healing in him. These values come out of our time listening to Jesus and listening to one another. Uh, We have four values in our document, and the heart behind each value is expressed all over the listening documents we have on the wall. Uh, Some of the values we recognize are aspirational. Uh, That basically means that we're we're starting to do it, but we really want to take it to the next level. Uh, But they are our discerned values nonetheless. It was clearly something that you could see highlighted over and over and over again. And so the first value that we want to talk about today is our value of pursuing wholeness with the triune God. Our value statement says, we look to the Father for identity, purpose, and provision. We look to Jesus for his leadership and direction. We teach about the Holy Spirit and pursue the filling of the Holy Spirit for empowered living. We desire to know, encounter, and root our lives in God in all his fullness. This is a rich statement. Uh, I could spend weeks unpacking all this paragraph contains. But the big idea behind this value is that we believe God's plan for your life is that you would grow to become more and more and more like Jesus. That's what God wants for your life. God has lots of plans for your life. But one of the plans that we don't often realize is that God wants you to look more and more and more like Jesus. This happens as we draw near to him. This happens as we allow him to transform us through the renewing of our minds. This happens as he brings change to us when we deal with sin and unforgiveness, wounds of the past, and the family baggage that hinders us and step into who he's created us to be. This is something that he does in us. I mean, we need to receive our adoption and identity from the Father. We need to receive teaching and direction and correction from Jesus. We need to be filled, empowered, and changed from the inside out by the Spirit. This change is something that God does in us in relationship. But the thing is, this change must also be pursued. The process of becoming like Jesus happens as we press into, as we say yes to, as we partner with and join in the work that Jesus wants to do in us, which is to make us like Jesus, bring us to a place of greater wholeness and peace day by day. And God actually calls us to join him on an upward journey. And so friends, God's plan for your life is a daily, weekly, monthly transformation in relationship with him. He wants your life to be increasingly whole, even as physically we age and we experience all kinds of trouble. But this wholeness is a battle. This wholeness isn't necessarily a linear curve. Uh, Sometimes, like kids, we'll go through growth spurts. Uh, Usually when challenges come, and as we lean into those challenges and allow Jesus to speak to us and meet us in those challenges, all of a sudden we find that we've, we've grown another level. We've grown another inch. We've achieved a different place and space of wholeness as he's dealt with some place of brokenness in our life. And so, friends, God's calling you to greater wholeness. He's calling you to greater maturity. He's calling you to become more and more and more like him. And as we consider this idea of growing in wholeness, it's helpful to consider first the idea of brokenness. Friends, there's profound brokenness in us and in the world around us. 
We see in Genesis 3 that through Adam and Eve's sin, humanity and all creation are subject to a curse. And that means that you and I are subject to a curse. Our earth, our planet is subject to a curse. And Paul, writing in Romans 1 to 3, paints a picture of the downward spiral of humanity because of the curse, and he picks the theme up a few different places. By the time he gets to Romans 8, he talks about how all creation is groaning under the weight of the curse, and our very cosmos is just desiring Jesus' full redemption so we can be released from the pain, from the agony, from the burden of the curse. And so there's this downward spiral that's recorded in the book of Romans. And in Romans 1 to 3, we get this glimpse, we get this truest picture of our reality when Paul writes in Romans 3, 10 to 18. This is what Paul says about us. Uh, This is what it looks like when we're looking in the mirror apart from Christ. No one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. Their talk is foul, the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They rush to commit murder. Destruction and misery always follow them. They don't know where to find peace. They have no fear of God at all. Isn't that an encouraging passage? Isn't that one you just want to memorize? Man, I just, I want to commit that to heart. And yet, friends, apart from Christ, this is us. This is the brokenness we experience in ourselves, in others, and in our world. Apart from Christ, we really are unrighteous, unwise, swift to hurt others. We have no peace. We have no fear of God. We are broken. And it's interesting because I don't have to I don't have to use my imagination very much. I don't have to look too hard in my life. Even having followed Jesus for like 30 some odd years, it doesn't take me very long to see the evidence, the fruit of that brokenness in my life. One of the interesting things that I remember from my Bible college days about this idea of brokenness and the darkness that's inside us is that it touches every part of our lives. It touches our physical bodies, it touches our emotions, it touches our identity in all the many ways that word can be used. Every part of us, every part of creation experiences a bit of the brokenness. But that's not the end of the story. While we're born into this world with brokenness and darkness, as we move through this world of darkness, Jesus came to reverse the curse. He came to redeem and restore all people to the Father's kingdom and return all things to his original shalom, his original wholeness. At the end of time, we see in Revelation 22 that Jesus accomplishes his mission. There is coming a day when it is all restored, it is all made right. But it's not just an end of time thing. Through his death and resurrection, as we place our faith and trust in Jesus, Jesus works to bring wholeness into our lives. As we come to Jesus, he makes us alive spiritually and we receive the Holy Spirit. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus breaks the penalty of sin in our lives because Jesus took that penalty upon himself. And so we can boldly say there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Forgiveness is available. Freedom from shame is possible as we bring things into the light with Jesus because Jesus has already taken the penalty upon himself. Not only is the penalty of sin dealt with, but the power of sin is broken in the lives of those who follow Jesus. Once we were enslaved to sin, but Jesus breaks those chains. We're no longer enslaved in the same way. We still choose to sin, but now we have choice. We have a new spiritual capacity to say no to sin and yes to God. And as Jesus makes us whole, we are more aware of temptation. We're more able to resist in Jesus' name. And in eternity, the presence of sin will be forever removed from us. And so Jesus is making us whole by dealing with sin, by dealing with the darkness, by dealing with the brokenness inside each one of us. Now, as we consider this idea of wholeness and brokenness, It's interesting because some believe that we don't need to participate to this degree in life change and transformation. 
Some would say that we don't need to spend the time going into the past, dealing with with wounds, forgiveness, and destructive family patterns. Some would say that we don't need to pursue wholeness to the extent that we're talking about. It's interesting, I've mentioned a number of times that I am both in mentoring and also mentoring a group of pastors. Uh, Every Thursday at noon, uh, I connect with a group of 14 of us. We're from eight denominations, five provinces, two countries. Uh, The biggest church, I think, is a church that's in the middle of a $9.5 million building campaign. And so just in terms of scale, uh, we are not in a $9.5 million building campaign. I think you've got to know that. that so, so some of our churches are smaller, some of the churches are bigger, but we're all gathering around uh, this idea of, of helping renew our churches by uh, being renewed as pastors. Uh, and so as part of our mentoring, we're working our way through, uh, we did Abide last year, uh, this very same or similar curriculum to what we've led some of our small groups through. Uh, And this year, we are working our way through the second level of the Way Discipleship Curriculum called Grow Character. Uh, Grow Character, like Soul Care, which we've also run here, is all about growing in wholeness as we deal with the places of darkness and brokenness in our lives. This week, we wound up in a discussion about just how much we do and how much God does in us. But it was interesting because all of us recognized our need to participate in the work of pursuing wholeness. But we had an interesting discussion about what it means that in Christ we become new creations. In many ways, uh, there was kind of this this continuum, and we were all probably in about the same place, but we were just wondering, okay, how much is Jesus going to do in us, and how much do we need to pursue? And as I've continued to think about that conversation, uh, it's pretty clear in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that Paul says that in Christ we become new. He writes, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. And and so God is going to do a lot of the work in us. He transforms us. He makes us new. In Colossians 1, verse 22, Paul says, yet now he's reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he's brought you into his own presence and you're holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Friends, God does so much for us in Christ. We're new creations. We stand before God holy and blameless. But in the same book that Paul describes this new standing we have because of Christ, Paul also talks about how we participate in this new kingdom life through Christ. And so let me read Colossians 3, 1 to 17 for you. It's a longer passage, but I think it paints the picture of participating in transformation. It talks about what it looks like to pursue wholeness in relationship with the triune God. And I want to read sections and then provide some commentary. And so Colossians 3, 1 to 17, first speaks about what God does in us, what he's done in us and for us. Colossians 3, verse 1 to 4 says, Since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth, for you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. Friends, when we place our faith and trust in Jesus, everything changes for us. Spiritually, we're raised to life. We're given new life in Christ. We step into the realest reality. We are invited to boldly approach the creator God of the universe. And it's only as we draw near to him that we can see things as they really are. And we're called to fix our eyes on that reality, to think about heavenly things, the most real things, the most lasting and eternal things. And so when we come to Christ, God does a wonderful work in us of making us new, making us alive. But then in relationship with God, in that new life, he calls us to participate in transformation. He calls us to pursue wholeness. Paul says, beginning in verse 5, So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. 
Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world, but now is the time to get rid of anger and rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you've stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us. Did you catch that, friends? You've been raised to new life with Christ. You are seated with him in the heavenlies and yet, even in this new life, Paul says there's still darkness. There's still sinful earthly things lurking. And as we join Jesus on the upward journey, there is a putting off. There is a putting to death. There is a recognition that there is darkness. There is brokenness. There are places where we've not fully invited the lordship of Jesus to rule and reign. Some of these dark places are from destructive family patterns. Some of these dark places are from the things that we've participated in in the past. Some are from things that we have done. Some are from things that others have done to us. Some are comfort sins, sins that we use and go to to feel in control or powerful. But friends, darkness is darkness. And in relationship with Jesus, we're called to pursue light we're called to pursue wholeness we're called to put on the new nature and this is a process this is a becoming who god has called us to be and there is that promise that he who began a good work in us will bring it to completion on the day of christ jesus but there's a participation we step in and we say yes paul continues in verse 12 by saying this since god chose you to be the holy people he loves you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. We're called to put off. And we're called to put on. This is how we participate in this new kingdom life. We clothe ourselves with Christ, with the love, the peace, the humility, the forgiveness of Jesus. These are active verbs. There's a pursuit. There's a choosing in this passage. But as we draw near and abide in Jesus, uh, he grows this fruit in us because apart from him, we can do nothing. But as we abide in Jesus, he produces fruit in us. And that fruit is evidenced as we clothe ourselves with Christ. And so we look to the Father for identity, purpose, and provision. We look to Jesus for his leadership and direction. We look to the Spirit for empowerment day by day. This passage in Colossians 3 is just one of many that calls us to be transformed, to be sanctified, to be holy as the one who called us is holy. This is a work that he does in us, and it's something we choose to step into. And it's interesting because there's a part of me that recognizes that God is going to call, uh, or he's going, to, um, he's going to do different things in different one of us as he calls us to step into holiness. I remember at our last church talking with a guy who'd been wrestling with, with some substance addictions. He'd been in the military, uh, and as part of the community, uh, there's a lot of substance abuse stuff. And when he came to Christ, one of the things that he said was that the taste uh, for the particular substance he was using just left his lips. God just freed him of that addiction in, in a moment. <laughs> and then I'd have a conversation with the next person one aisle over who was in a daily agonizing battle against that very same thing. And so friends, sometimes this wholeness, God's going to take one thing away easily, but a lot of the times there's going to be that battle, there's going to be that choosing, there's going to be that putting to death. And as we step into this transformation, as we pursue wholeness in relationship with the triune God, uh, Paul in Philippians 2, 12 and 13 says this. 
He says, work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. Work hard. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. It's a partnership, friends. It's relationship. We work hard, obeying God with deep reverence and fear, but God works even harder in us, giving us the desire and the power to do those things that please him. And so this is one of our values. This is how we will see people find hope and healing in Jesus as we join him on mission. We are going to pursue wholeness in relationship with the triune God. We are going to work hard and pursue obedience. And as God works in us, he's going to give us the desire and the power to do those things that please him. And as we experience healing, we are then able to help others find the hope and healing that we ourselves have experienced. So what does this value look like expressed in our church? Well, it means you'll hear us preaching and teaching wholeness principles. Uh, I have preached somewhere in the neighborhood of 270 sermons here. 52 weeks a year, I preach about 48. Uh, we've been here five and a half years, 270. That's the math, the way the math works out. Uh, somewhere in there, maybe it's down to 250, but uh, we'll call it somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, I've probably pre preached on Colossians 3 more than once. Because it's an important passage. It's this wholeness stuff. Uh, I am still growing. I'm desiring to grow. We're not always going to preach the same five or six messages. But friends, one of the things that's going to happen uh, as we experience this wholeness principle in our congregation is you're going to hear us teaching and preaching wholeness principles. When we find them in different passages, we're going to highlight them and say, hey, this is a wholeness principle. This is about putting off the old self. This is about stepping into the new. This is about confession of sin. This is about uh, walking in freedom. This is about dealing with those dark places. We're going to be preaching and teaching wholeness principles. It's just the way we do things. In many of our small groups, we'll be talking about wholeness, uh, whether it's through soul care or through abide or through grow character material. There's going to be wholeness principles uh, that we're interacting with in small groups. Uh, at some point, we'll probably run an event that will help you experience greater freedom and wholeness. Uh, we've actually taken some members of our leadership team a number of years ago uh, to an event called Encounter God uh, at Heartland in Sherwood Park to help our leadership team step into greater freedom and wholeness. And so when we're in small groups, we're going to be talking about pursuing wholeness in relationship with the triune God. And when you come and talk with us about something in your life, uh, we're probably going to lead you to these wholeness questions because we believe that Jesus has greater wholeness for you and we want to help you step into the hope and healing that can be found in Jesus. So Jesus is on mission to redeem and restore all people to the Father's kingdom and return all things to his original shalom. We join Jesus on his mission by connecting the generations in Christ-centered community to make and equip spirit-empowered, multiplying disciples. We long to see people find hope and healing in Jesus, and that will happen as we ourselves pursue wholeness with the triune God. And so we look to the Father for identity, purpose, and provision. We look to Jesus for his leadership and direction. We teach about the Holy Spirit and pursue the filling of the Holy Spirit for empowered living. We desire to know, encounter, and root our lives in God in all his fullness. Because when God wants to renew a church, he begins by renewing the leader. When God wants to renew your family, he begins by renewing you. When God wants to renew your workplace, he's going to begin by renewing you. And so we pursue this wholeness. This is one of our values. Uh, and if you want to check it out, look for anything that says healing uh, or, uh, or shalom or peace on the board over here. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace and your goodness. And we thank you that you save us just as we are. You love us exactly as we are, but your desire is that we wouldn't stay that way because you want to make us more and more and more like Jesus. Father, we thank you that on the cross, uh, through the atonement, Jesus, you made this wholeness possible. By your stripes, we are healed. And so, Jesus, would you help us to step into the wholeness that you have for us? And we recognize that sometimes that wholeness is going to come with a limp. 
We see even in the life of the patriarch Jacob that in his most dramatic encounter with you, the humility came at a great cost. He walked with a limp from that day forward, but in that limp, he was transformed because he was pursuing relationship with you. And so, Father, would you increase in us uh, our understanding of the identity that you've given us? Would we be a people of humility who look to you for provision, for direction? Jesus, uh, you are our good shepherd, and so we look to you for uh, your direction, for your correction. Jesus, lead our church, lead our lives. And Spirit, we pray for a fresh filling and a fresh encounter with you, uh, that we may see your victory anew and afresh in these dark places in our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.